Hello YouTube, welcome back to yet another installment of my Dota 2 Starter Strategy Series where I show you the ins and outs, the do's and the don'ts and all that jazz about some great heroes to start the game with and just as a forewarning, this it's video is going to contain a lot of don'ts so what I really hope you guys walk away with from watching this are examples of how to properly play specific heroes. In this case, this video is going to focus on Lifestealer and things that you shouldn't do so that you don't have to repeat the same mistakes that I do. I want you to learn from my horridness at this game. So, anyway, this video is going to focus on Lifestealer, most specifically, Jungling Lifestealer. We're going to begin right away with a couple really horrible mistakes. So, the very first one that I want to talk about is I am way too close to the easy camp when it spawns, so therefore it does not. Mistake number one. Mistake number two is I randomed Lifestealer this game, so I got a little bit of extra bonus gold. I decided to go for a bit of a, a cute item build here with a Quelling Blade. Gloves of Haste, and a Tango. You're going to discover right away that this was kind of a mistake. Look how much more damage this Ogre Camp is doing to me without the inclusion of a Stout Shield. You've got to have a Stout Shield in junglers like this, guys. It's absolutely critical. By doing this, I, I'm going to waste almost all of my starting region, and then I'm going to be in a bit of trouble. So, two huge mistakes right off the bat, but I assure you that the video is not going to consist of this much fail. But again, I want to show this to you so that you don't repeat the same things. So, you can see that I'm actually looking in the shop right now thinking, yeah, I need a stout shield. So, I'm going to go ahead and buy one right away, just as soon as this ogre goes down. And then I'm going to go ahead and go back to the easy camp and try to finish that off. So, definitely a rough start. Now, uh, I'm going to go ahead and talk about Lifestealer's skills, abilities, and all that stuff. But first, I want to explain why I decided to go this early Gloves of Haste build. I'm going to go ahead and go into Hero Chase, and I want to look at a very specific item, and that is going to be Hand of Midas. So, hide this. Midas, good. So, Hand of Midas, if you guys are not familiar with this item, but you come from League of Legends, think of this kind of like um, Smite, except in form of an item. It consists of two components, the Gloves of Haste, and a recipe. The recipe is quite expensive. Now, this item, it allows you to generate quite a bit of extra gold and experience if used correctly. However, do not buy this if you are past around the seven or eight minute mark, especially not past the 10 minute mark. It is absolutely crucial. You get this item as fast as possible. This is why I picked up the Fast Gloves of Haste to try to help with this. And by the way, look how much difference the Stout Shield is making. You can see the minus 20 appearing each time one of these wolves hits me, or 60% of the time. So blocking 20 damage 60% of the time is absolutely massive. There are uh, so many things I need to talk about here. I hope I can find time to do so before the action really picks up, which uh, I assure you will happen in not too terribly long. So I'm just kind of trying to catch back up here. I had a really rough start. I'm not that behind yet, as you can see, but the uh, other lanes are going to start getting ahead of me pretty quickly because of my nasty start. Now, one thing I did go ahead and do is I picked up some Observer Wards, which I'm going to bring to me fairly soon. Reason being is because we have a Pudge on the enemy team, but we do not currently have any Wards upon the map. I'm actually going to switch Fog of War to show only our side. So, we have no Wards. This is a huge mistake by us, especially when you have extremely strong gankers like uh, Pudge, Bane, Night Stalker. Characters like that on the enemy team that are mid, if they have any idea what they're doing, they're going to make your life absolute hell. Very, very important. So, for whatever reason, I'm uh, waiting to bring myself those wards. I need to go ahead and get those up ASAP. I actually may go back to base, but uh, now I'm going to decide to take out the Sunkar camp. This is a good chance for me to talk about life your skills and why he's so good in the jungle. If you're not familiar with this character, you may have been wondering how I'm regenerating life the way that I am, and I'm actually gaining health from fighting the Centaur camp. Uh, Lifestealer's second skill, Feast, what this does is that every time you hit a target, you regenerate a portion of that damage back as life. So notice when I'm hitting the Centaur, plus 12, plus 8, plus 4, then it dies. So the higher the enemy's HP is, the more health you're going to get back from your Feast ability. This is really, really strong, and the entire reason why Lifestealer is quite an effective jungler. It allows you to stay in the jungle almost indefinitely if you use the right item build. This game I did not. I cannot emphasize this enough, guys. Do not go Gloves of Haste this early if you don't have a very specific plan in mind. I screwed up my item build this game. And again, I'm showing this to you so you don't have to repeat the same errors that I do. Now, the Gloves of Haste is just generally a good item on Lifestealer, even by itself, even though it's obviously a component to other items like Hand of Midas, uh, Power Tread, stuff like that. But he needs attack speed. The higher your attack speed, the more often you're going to proc your Feast. 
Makes sense. Therefore, it's going to make you more sustainable, and you're going to take less damage overall. Looks like our Pudge got first blood, or our, our uh, Kunkka got first blood on the Pudge, which is a great start. That's such a good start. Generally speaking, uh, you don't see Pudge get first blooded very often. So, going back in the jungle, I've got a pretty decent setup now. I've got my Quelling Blade, Stout Shield, uh, gloves, uh, uh, gloves, of, uh, gloves of Haste. I was about to say Gloves of Speed, but you knew what I was talking about. And I've got a set of Tangos. Now, all this being said, there is absolutely no reason I should have to go back to base barring conflict with other enemy players. I can sustain myself indefinitely. The next item I would probably go for in a typical scenario... Dep well, depending on the course of the game, if it was a fairly passive game, not a lot was going on, I would start immediately on my armlet. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. I would start immediately on my Helm of Iron Will to build into an armlet. I'm going to talk more about this as the video progresses, but the Helm of Iron Will will allow you to jungle indefinitely with its armor and HP regeneration. Lifestealer is that good. You will not have to go back to base if you have this item in conjunction with a Quelling Blade and Stout Shield. Very, very nice. So, let's go ahead and talk about Lifestealer skills again. I've already won over Feast. This is such a good skill. Typically, again, in a passive game, I will max this first. In a much more active game, I'll probably max his first skill, Rage. Rage is a built-in BKB. This gives you magic immunity for a specific duration, and this is actually really important. So, I'm going to go and pause the video for a second. I'm going to go back into player perspective. Now, I came down here. I noticed the Pudge was about to grab the invisibility rune. So the very first thing I did here was I used the open wounds to slow him down and make sure he couldn't grab this. Open wounds, by the way, is a slow and gives... I'm going to talk about more after this, after this team fight. But generally speaking, just a quick note, it's a slow and it gives life leech to anybody on your team attacking this hero. Now, I want you to very closely watch the order of abilities I use. First, I slow Pudge down. Then, I wait... To, to pop my Rage, and it blocks all the damage from the hook. Again, Rage makes you magic immune. This is a built-in BKB. So I avoided all the damage from his hook. And I'm also avoiding all the damage from his Rot and his ultimate. That is really bugging out right now. <laughs> but, uh, you see that my Rage is now worn off, and I'm taking damage again from him. Wisdom's coming in for the assist. Kunkka's coming in to back me up as well. I am really, really close to death here. Really good heal going down by the Omni Knight. Uh, looks like our Courier's in a little bit of danger, but it's going to be okay. Kunkka does die. I'm going to pop my Rage again, go back in, and finish off the Pudge. So, that was nasty. That was really, really close. <laughs> the the uh, nice clutch heal by the Omni Knight. Uh, Viper is going to perma-slow this Tide Hunter if we pull this off just right. So, I need one more, and I'm going to go and do a little bit of additional damage. I think... Uh, I don't think he could have lived, but the Tide Hunter made a mistake there. Whenever he Anchor Smash, that does not slow me down. So I, I think his Anchor Smash there was definitely a huge mistake. He could have at least made it to the tower, and he could have made our life very, very difficult. Now, again, what I want you to walk away with from that uh, little skirmish there is the way you use your abilities is very important. I'm going to go and talk a little bit more about his first ability, Rage. So not only is this a magic immunity, but it gives quite a lot of bonus attack speed. This ability scales really, really well. You're going to get 15 attack speed per level, and you're also going to get, looks like, uh, 1.75 duration until level 3 to 4 on Magic Immunity. But anyway, it's close to 5 seconds of Magic Immunity at level, level 4. This ability is so, so good. Open Wounds, talk a little bit more about this. This ability does not scale as well, and this is generally the ability that I'm going to level up last. I'm going to leave this at level 1 for quite some time. The slow at 70% is pretty nice. Now, the one kind of underrated thing you're not noticing about this is what I mentioned before, is that anybody on your team attacking this target, not just you, is going to get the life leech benefit. You can see that the uh, scaling isn't that great. It doubles the life leech from level 1 to level 4, and the uh, cooldown on it goes down. That's it. The duration stays the same. So an ability like this, you can leave it level 1 for quite some time if you're safe about that. Looks like our top might go down. That's unfortunate, but uh, not a huge deal. We're still doing pretty well this game. Now, Lifestealer's Ultimate. This, this ability is fun. The way this works is that you're able to infest a target unit. This does not work on enemy heroes, but it works on friendly creeps, enemy creeps, and friendly heroes. Whenever you infest a target, you become completely invisible to the enemy, and you basically ride around inside of your target. If you go inside a creep and use this... <laughs> it's, I think I'm going to use this pretty soon, actually, but if you go inside a creep and use this, 
and you exit out of the creek, you're going to explode out in a wonderful confetti explosion of fun, and yeah, you're going to see how this works. It also does AoE damage in quite a large radius around the explosion area. And another thing, too, is that if you infest a creep, you're going to gain health that the creep has. Level 3, you're going to gain the creep's maximum HP. Levels 1 through 2, you're going to gain his current HP. I'm 99% sure that's how that works. But really cool ability, and you can use it in a lot of really creative and interesting ways. So, I have my Hand of Midas finished. The, the Hand of Midas is... I would consider this almost late. But again, I had to buy these wards to make sure that we could keep an eye on the rune spot down here. You saw how valuable that was in that fight that just happened where we saw Pudge going from the invisibility room. It's so important to do that stuff. Now, I go ahead and I use my hand of Midas right away. Do not forget to use its active if you have this item, otherwise it is a complete waste. Got a little bit of contention going on for the rune spot here. Looks like Tidehunter is going to be down here, so it's very likely that uh, Wisp is going to be there as well. Yep, got a lot of people mid, so we, we got kind of a bit of a Mexican standoff going here, but looks like nothing's happening quite yet, and it looks like the rune, yep, rune is going to be down there. Okay, so I slow down the uh, Tidehunter. He does immediately pop his Ravage. The regeneration is going to be completely nullified by the damage. Looks like we might be able to take this guy out. Bloodseeker is coming in for a backup. Nice hook going down by the Pudge, going to get the Whisper out of danger. Now, one thing I want you to, to notice right away, I'm going to go and pause this, is... Me chasing this Tidehunter was completely pointless. Is there any way I'm going to catch up to him and kill him? No, absolutely not. I started chasing him from about right here, and I chased him... Let me go ahead and go back into... Can I draw on the map like this? No, actually I can't. That's okay. But I started chasing him at about right here, and I stopped chasing it about right here. Then I come back down and start helping my team. That's a huge mistake. If your team is engaged in like a big brawl like this, and you're chasing after a fleeing target, you're being, uh, don't be that guy. You gotta get back in this fight. Don't chase targets that you know you're not gonna catch up with. Not only was my open wounds on cooldown, but there was no possible way I was gonna have enough mana to use this again in time. So, just another important thing to keep in mind. Let's go back into this team fight. I do get stunned by the uh, Wisp. I use my ultimate there to try to do a little bit of AoE damage. I don't really necessarily like the way that I just use that, and Pudge commits suicide. Pretty standard. Now, the reason that I used my ultimate the way that I did is I was going to deal 150 magical damage and quite a large AoE. Um, 700 radius is pretty large. That's just a little bit under tower range. Uh, tower range is about 900 on where a tower can start shooting you. So 700 is actually quite big. So you saw that I hit at least two enemy heroes there, but it definitely was not enough to do any substantial damage to them. So not a huge loss. Unfortunately, the Pudge did commit suicide, so we lost the uh, we lost the golden XP we could have gotten from that. But that's okay. A little bit more about Hand of Midas. The way this works is that... Generally, in the early game, you want to use this on higher level creeps, like for example, this uh, level 5 bird that I'm fighting right here. So, I use the Hand of Midas on that. You saw I got a big jump in experience. It grants two and a half times the experience of the normal amount that you would get. And it grants a flat 190 gold. As you go into the mid and possibly late game, if you still have this item, you want to use this on lower level creeps to balance out the amount of gold that you're going to get, if that makes sense. Think of it this way. Say you're in the hard camp, if you use this item on the biggest creature within the camp, sure you're going to get the 190 gold, but what if you use this on a creep that was worth like 8 gold instead, and you turn that to 190? You're not going to get as much XP from this, so you got to kind of play a balancing game. What do you really need at the time? Do you need more XP, or do you need more gold? Early game, generally speaking, you should be using this on the bigger creeps to get your levels up as fast as you can. So even though I had a bad jungle start here, I'm gonna go and take a quick look at the individual graphs here. So I'm not all that behind. By the way, all gold per minute this game on pretty much everybody is not that great, including myself. Um, I'm not terribly behind even despite my bad jungle start, and I have Hand of Midas to thank for that. I'm only a little bit under solo mid and two levels under solo top. Not terrible, not the best. This definitely could have gone better. Looks like we're going to have a pause here. That's okay. That actually gives me a little bit of time to talk about some other things. So, again, Hand of Midas, do not buy this item if you're past about the 8, 9 minute, especially 10 minute mark. Absolutely do not. This item takes, uh, to pay for its entire recipe cost and the Gloves of Haste, takes right around 16 and a half-ish minutes, I think, the last time I looked at the stats for it. It takes that long to pay for itself. 
Now understand that the XP bonus you're going to get in the meantime is really good, but it again, in pure gold value, it's going to take about that long to pay for itself. After that, yeah, you're going to start generating some profit, but it takes quite a bit. It's definitely an investment. So uh, you notice that this game, I maxed out my feast first. I do not always do this. As a matter of fact, I will say that in more aggressive games, that is actually a mistake. You've got to max out your rage first. Having the extra duration and the extra attack speed bonus is really, really vital if you're playing an extremely active game. This game so far, eh, kind of. Um, I am actually debating my choices on maxing out Feast as quickly as I did. Feast is great for sustaining yourself and be, having a very, very safe jungle. And of course, you are going to max that out second in pretty much any situation. But this Lifestealer is definitely another character where, I know I say this in every video that I make, but do not have static item or static skill builds. Always be adjusting to the situation. Whenever I was playing this game, I think I played this game about probably about a week ago, I felt like that there was not enough really activity in the game to warrant picking up more levels in Rage early on. And, eh, I don't know, the, the team fights that happened at the uh, Roshan Ward spot may have went a little bit differently if I had higher levels in Rage. Who knows? But, just some food for thought. So, I want to gank mid, and I'm actually going to use my ultimate in an interesting way here. So, let me show you guys what you can do. You can ult inside a creep. Dyer's now keep in mind the enemy down. cannot see attack. this. They have no idea that I'm inside this creep right now. What I'm waiting for is I'm waiting for Pudge to either hook somebody or I'm waiting for the creep to push up where I can get in range to start attacking the Pudge. So our Omni Knight's trying to bait this out. I ult out, I use my slow immediately, and he is in a lot of trouble. Here if I go down and Pudge dies very, very easily. That was so much life to steal. That was kind of a silly ultimate by the Omni Knight, but hey, that's okay. Not a huge waste. Yeah, very, very easy kill. You can use his infest in so many cool ways. <laughs> That's just one way you can do it. So I'm finally going to pick up my boots. This is a really, really late boots, by the way. I decided to go ahead and just finish my power treads and just bring the whole item to me right away. Again, I'm not always going to do this, but... That's okay. I bring myself some, uh, yep, Power Treads, Town Portal Scroll, and a Clarity Potion. The reason I bring myself this Clarity Potion is your, your mana regen is really, really bad throughout most of the game. And while you're not a character that really needs a whole lot of mana regen, it's, it's kind of helpful, but not to the point where I would actively buy a mana regen item. For example, uh, Perseverance or uh, Medallion of Courage. I, well, Medallion of Courage might not be too bad, actually, but... If you buy an item like Perseverance, that is a huge waste. Like, that is an enormous waste. The other stats on it, you don't you don't need HP regen at all. This is a character where you can get away with having virtually no HP regen. You just simply don't need it. Your feast is way too good. So, I'm going to grab this double damage. And the reason that I do this is because I don't want anybody from the enemy team grabbing this. If Rakunku was still mid at this time, I would absolutely guard that for him until he could get there. And notice right away, I'm making one mistake right now. Can you see what it is? My hand of Midas is off cooldown and I'm not using it. I'm wasting time. Blessing. Really, really important stuff. You always have to be aware of your active abilities at all times. That's really is what's going to separate you from being just simply an average player to uh, a good player. So, oh my god, this is painful to watch. <laughs> I hope I use this. Okay, so I use it on a range creep. That's okay. Not a huge loss. Uh, I would have rather use it, you know, like on a big... Uh, big jungle creep, but I think I finally woke up and said, oh god, I've got to use my hand of Midas. Yeah, never, ever have this off a of cooldown for longer than just a couple of seconds if you can help it. Never get into, like, a, always be paying attention to what you're doing in the game. That's really, really important. You can also see that, uh, I think I did this a few minutes ago, I wasn't paying attention, but I dropped down my ward yet again at that spot. You've got to have at least one of these spots ward on the map at all times, preferably both. And if your support does not buy these items, which in this case the Omni Knight did not, uh, it comes down to somebody buy it. I mean, uh, way too many players, I, I think this kind of carries over from League of Legends, way too many players get into the attitude they say, oh, I'm the carry, or oh, I'm mid, it shouldn't be my responsibility to buy, to buy wards, it's not my problem. Yes, it is your problem. If your support does not buy wards, do it. 
I, I don't care what role you're playing, you have to do it. <laughs> and me being the jungler, I'm not going to be as item dependent early on in the game, so I took it upon myself to buy wards down there. Pudge coming in with a haste, great repel by the Omni Knight, completely immune to Pudge's ultimate right now, and by the way, your open wounds does not affect the haste to target. So a bit of a mistake by me there, you notice I cast that on the Pudge, but open wounds does not affect the haste to target. He's coming back in here, I'm going to go ahead and use my raids for the magic community to prevent damage from his hook and for a little bit more attack speed. And things are getting a little sloppy here. Uh, Omni Knight Ultimate does go down, and it looks like we are intent on killing this Bloodseeker. We are probably going to get a kill here. Again, nice hook by the Pudge going down, but he's going to sacrifice his life to possibly save the Bloodseeker. And it looks like he does get away. I actually think that we could have got that kill, to be honest. So I don't know why we ran away. And I heard Tidehunter use his ultimate, too. But it looks like he completely missed everybody. <laughs> uh, I was very intent on getting this tower from the looks of it. So a bit of a misplay by me. I think that we probably could have gotten the Bloodseeker. But given the fact that he got away, uh, I'm almost certain that Kunkka's boat missed. So that's kind of unfortunate. But that's okay. We take a tower out of the deal, and we get a kill on the Pudge. He did not commit suicide that time, so definitely a nice win for us. Like I mentioned before, my next major item is going to be an armlet. Let's go and talk about Life Sealer's core, and then we can go into some possible extensions of his build. Let's hope I have enough time to do this before the next uh, all hell breaks out moment occurs. Anyway, let's go into the shop and take a look at armlet. So, armlet. God, I love this item. Armlet is... There is almost no item that is better on Life Stealer than Armlet. I'll talk about why. Armlet gives you all the stat that you're going to need for a melee carry. Damage, attack speed, armor, and yeah, if you're in a fight, having that bonus HP regen is nice. Now, that's actually nullified while you're in a fight. I don't know why the hell I just said that, but while you're in a fight, this Armlet is going to drain 37 HP per second. This is completely nullified by the fact that if you're on top of a target using your feast, you're not going to notice that all that much. That's why this item is so good on Life Stealer. Definitely pick this up as your first major item. It is way too good not to do so. You're going to benefit from the damage, you're going to benefit from the attack speed, and the strength. You're going to benefit from every single stat on this item. Really, really good pickup. So, coming in on this Tidehunter, I pop my Rage just to make sure he can't get a gush off and slow me. Very, very easy kill. I tell you, I'm so glad that Val was behind the uh, development of this game, the custom voice lines, and that they really add so much. I really, really enjoy that. So pick up a really nice, easy kill on the Tide Hunter there, absolutely no problem. And I'm going to go back in the jungle again. Life Stealer, uh, just to give you a better idea, of, like you know what his purpose, what his role is. He he has a potential to be one of the hardest carries in the game. If Life Stealer gets fed and he gets a lot of items, there is no stopping this guy. I would actually argue that he has a harder carrying ability than a lot of the, uh, you know, classical hard carries, like say, you know, like a Morphling or a Faceless or guys like that. This Life Stealer is almost unstoppable. Now, Life Stealer has one very, very glaring weakness that uh, those characters kind of have Dyer's natural resistance to, and that's the fact that Life Stealer can be kited. Let's say, for example, that the enemy team had a Viper. If the Viper was playing very well, what they would do is they would wait for my raids to wear off, and Viper Slow would effectively make it so that I could not ever get up on a target. This is why Life Stealer is generally considered not as competitively viable, as some other potential hard carries, but it, in games, uh, again, I want to emphasize that the, this is not a high-level game. Matter of fact, I would not even consider this like a mid-skill-level game. This is a very, very everyday, run-of-the-mill public game. Now, it is 5-on-5 five five matchmaking, keep that in mind. Um, oh, I remember what happens here. This is really embarrassing. The Morphling gets off a really clutch replicate, and I flail around like an idiot for about 10 seconds, and I die. So what what the Morphling did there is he used his replicate on me and blocked me in with my own illusion. So, got pretty owned there, but that's okay. Don't do not do that. Like, don't flail around like a retard. You saw me madly clicking to go backwards. Oh, there's an illusion in the way. What do I do? That was really, really bad. So that's my first death. I'm going to go and pick up a couple of Town Portal Scrolls just to have them in my inventory. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I want to get back in the fight as quickly as I can. And notice, yet again, my hand of Midas is uh, off a of cooldown. Uh, Ravage going down, catches two of us here. The uh, Morphling and the Wisp really doing work here. A lot of attack speed coming out of the overcharge. And unfortunately, we do lose two more heroes there. Tides. 
take so you. that kind of sucks. But again, this game is definitely uh, so far. It's you know we've got a pretty good, we've got a small tower advantage, got a kill advantage. I think that overall as well, we probably have a goal and XP advantage as well. We'll take a look at that after this little skirmish. So heroes coming in. I popped my slow on the morphling. Kind of pointlessly. I did make. I did remember to use my hand Midas, though. I got that down. Rupture going down on the Viper. He's going to have to back away from this. It looks like the Morphling is going to be able to get another kill here. And... Okay, I used my ultimate there to make sure that I could stay alive. I need to go and turn on my armlet right away to give myself an extra bonus health. And let's back out out of that fight. So, while that fight was really, really sloppy and I easily could have died there... I want to talk about how I survived. I infested inside of an enemy creep, and I gained... Oh my god, that was terrible. I infested <laughs> inside of an enemy creep. What that does is, like I mentioned earlier, that's going to go ahead and give you health equal to what the creep currently has, or if it's level 3 ultimate, it creeps maximum HP. That kept me alive there. Then, I used the armlet, and I was able to gain uh, plus 25 strength, which is going to be roughly equal to about a um, little over 400 HP. So, that kept me alive during the whole fight. Life Stealer is pretty resilient. Now, notice how I'm teleporting in outside of vision range of the Pudge. Use my slow. Use my magic immunity. That's a dead Pudge. But, unfortunately, yet again, he does commit suicide. And I recall I was not happy about that. God, I hate that so much. But, yeah, he was able to get out of that. What's important to take away from that is that I teleported outside of vision range of the Pudge so that he wasn't able to see me coming in. Yeah, I'm doing a little bit of trash talking there, but uh, that's okay. That's healthy. Go back in the jungle, farm a little bit more. So, where can I go from here? There are a lot of viable item choices on Lifestealer. And by the way, uh, Power Treads is just kind of my personal preference, but I encourage you guys to try something like uh, Phase Boots. Like, Lifestealer does have a lot of problems with getting kited, if the enemy team knows what they're doing. Phase Boots can kind of help counteract that. You're going to need those bursts of speed to catch up to somebody. Let's say your open wounds isn't quite enough to keep the target slowed for long enough. Maybe Phase Boots can help with that. I personally prefer Power Treads, but, you know, try different things. See what works for you. See what works in different situations. So, my core is done. I have my treads, and I have my armlet. That is the absolute core build and life stealer. That's really about all you need. And from here, you can go a lot of different ways. Let's go and see how that team fight goes, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So it looks like that uh, the blood sealer is just about to go down. A uh, pretty good boat coming in. It's going to hit two two heroes and focus down the blood stealer or blood seeker, <laughs> blood stealer. Um, I ult inside of the Omni Knight just to try to do a little bit more AOE damage to this guy's. Ravage going down yet again, and oh man, gosh, this is this is definitely nasty. So the nice thing about this is that I'm able to make them go away, but notice how much trouble I'm having killing these guys. I, I can't keep up with them, especially against a character like Wisp, who's going to give a bonus move speed to both her target and herself. Yeah, that's really, really tough. I, I just I can't keep up with these guys. I'm not like Morphling where I'm ranged and I can gush into position. Or I'm not like Faceless Void where I have a built-in bash to make sure that I can stay on a target and an ultimate to hold them in place. These are Lifestealer's weaknesses. But if Lifestealer can stay on a target, you're going to be perfectly fine. So I pick up a Javelin. Uh, very likely I'm going to be going for a Skull Basher here. So let's go ahead and take a look at that item if you're not familiar with it. Hide this, hide that, and Skullbasher. Alright, Skullbasher is a pretty good item, but this is a very, very situational item. This is not core by any means, but Lifestealer benefits from every single one of these stats. You're going to benefit from the damage, you're going to benefit from the strength, especially considering you're a strength-based hero, and it's going to give you a chance to bash, which is the main reason you're buying it. So the bash chance... 25% stun for 1.4 seconds. The reason this is so important on Life Stealer is for all the reasons that I've been mentioning throughout this video is that you have to stay on a target and you have to be able to get off hits or else you're going to be very, very vulnerable. <coughs> Excuse me. You're going to be very, very vulnerable. I would not buy this item in every single game. If you look at our team lineup, we have no hard stuns at all. The closest thing that we have is Kunkka's Gush and his Boat. That's it. Other than that, we have no stuns whatsoever. So I'm trying to fill in the gap by buying an item like this. It looks like I'm doing a little bit of stalking on the Morphling down here, so we might see a nice one-on-one -on -one fight happening soon. I notify my team that, he, that he's here, but I say, what the hell, I'm going to go in. Turn on my armlet. 
Start whacking him a little bit. I'm doing a lot of damage to this guy. Now I'm going to activate my slow to give me some lifesteal, activate my rage, and he's going to have to run away. I use my ultimate to get my health back up and do some more damage to him. He's being smart here, though. Notice how he's using his strength morph to get his health back up, and he's going to be able to survive that. However, I walk away with the confidence knowing that I could probably one-on-one -on -one this guy if it really came down to it. He's coming back in. He should have left a long time ago. Now he might be in a little bit of trouble. Good heal going down. Great X marks a spot going down by the Kuga. That's going to let us get the kill on this guy. So while I like how the Morphling handled the situation, I don't like how he stuck around. That was a huge mistake by him. Nice one-on-one -on -one fight. Kudos to you, sir. But yeah, do not stick around, especially whenever the enemy team did not have vision. I don't think they've thrown down a, a single ward this entire game. <laughs> not that I've noticed anyway. Lifestealer is a pretty good tower killer. Notice how fast I'm taking this down in conjunction with my armlet and my uh, rage. By the way, guys, do not forget to turn this off. No, I've been toggling this on and off throughout the entire game. That's really, really important. Looks like we might be able to catch a Bloodseeker and a Wisp here. Uh, another fail boat going down. That's okay. Good X marks the spot. That's probably going to allow us to get this kill. Nice uh, stun by the Wisp. It slows us down a little bit, but it's not going to be quite enough. All right, good. It looks like we're going to be able to pick up yet another tower from this. So, while the enemy team, uh, they're playing okay, they're definitely sticking around too long, and I think that we are sticking around too long in this case here, too. So, we got a few teleports coming in here. It looks like the Wisp is going to come back in as well. Uh, Tidehunter Ravage does go down. We're all going to be stunned for quite some time from this. I'm losing a lot of health really, really quickly. Unfortunately, I do get demolished. It goes down as well. Tidehunter Gush is going to guarantee at least one other kill here if he's able to get it off. And it's going to be close. Yep, there it is right there. Morphling's probably going to go ahead and... Uh, uh, this, that, this could actually be really close. He just needs to wait for him in. Or he's, he, that's, I like his decision here just to take down the tower. Smart play. Okay, so traded towers there and probably broke even on kills. Not the best situation. But meanwhile, uh, Broodmother up top is doing her job very, very well. So Broodmother's pushing this tower, putting pressure on it. By the way, if you play Broodmother, this is exactly what you should be doing. Broodmother is a very, very poor team fighter, and she excels at applying pressure. So I like the Broodmother's play here. Definitely good stuff. All right. Pick up my Skull Basher, pick up another Town Portal Scroll. Now I'm starting to develop a little bit as a carry. <clears throat> Come back into the game here and sell my stout shield, pick up my town pearl scrolls. Good. All right. Might have another fight breaking out down here at bottom. I teleport in to defend. Let's see what happens. I remember to use my hand of Midas. Got to remember to do that. I use my magic immunity. I use my ultimate immediately to do a lot of AoE damage to these guys. And, uh, yeah, you can tell they're already kind of getting scared. The Tidehunter is being slowed by the Degenar from the Omni Knight. He's definitely going to go down here. He doesn't really stand much of a chance. And he does die. Good stuff. Okay, definitely got a team fight going on here. Boat misses, but that's going to be okay. Uh, Morphling is under the effect of my open wounds. Wisp comes in, definitely going to try for a clutch save here, and it looks like I'm going after the Wisp. By the way, this is really who you should be targeting in fights like this. Morphling is a very, very tempting target, but if you cannot take that Wisp down, you're probably not going to kill the Morphling. The Wisp overcharge at level 4 gives, I think, a 20% uh, damage reduction. That is huge, guys. That is so huge and gives a lot of attack speed. Wisp is really, really squishy, so targeting the Morphling right away there was a mistake on my part. Just a few other things to keep in mind. So I've got my Skull Basher. I've got my Armlet. What can I do from here? Lifestealer benefits from attack speed. He benefits from damage, and he benefits from critical strike. Basically all the things that would benefit carries typically. What he doesn't typically benefit from are items that focus solely on defense. For example, a Black King bar. I teleport top because I have a haste rune, and oh man, Bloodseeker's in a lot of trouble here. I use my slow. He's going to silence himself for a little bit more damage, but it's not going to be enough. I have so much attack speed right now, coupled with my armlet and my rage. Wisp is going to teleport in, try to save him. Big mistake, though. And you can see just how squishy Wisp is. I'm going to be able to take him out in just a couple hits here. And not quite enough. So, while the uh, Wisp... Trying to help his teammate out is definitely appreciated. Just a little bit too late and a little bit too aggressive. And I'm able to pick up a double kill there with the help of the haste room. So, good stuff. I think this particular game, what I'm going to go for is some more attack speed first. So, I believe I pick up a hyperstone. Good. 
Let's go and take a look at what this can build into, and we'll talk about some possibilities. If we look at Hyperstone, Hyperstone can build into two very good items for Lifestealer. Assault Kiras is definitely one of the more uh, common choices that I like for this character. However, this particular game, are its auras and its armor really going to help us all that much? What physical DPSers do they have on their team aside from uh, Morphling? I'm not that scared of Bloodseeker. Really, the only guy the uh, armor or aura is really going to benefit is going to be against Morphling. Let's take a look at this team fight here. Pudge does get off a hook, but uh, I'm trying to take down this Tide Hunter. I should be focusing the Wisp in this particular situation. Chasing out the Pudge. This is a mistake. I should not be diving in this far. While I do get the Pudge, I'm trading my own life for this. That is not smart. Definitely not smart play. What I should have done in that situation is turn back around and try to keep control of the Morphling. Maybe in that situation I would have even been able to help my team get out alive. Hard to say at this point, but don't dive in like this, guys. Don't chase. I'm chasing way, 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 way too much that game. Definitely some bad mistakes. So, talk a bit more about this. Assault Curious is a great item because it gives you a lot of attack speed, which is something you obviously need. Gives you some bonus armor, which is great against, like, a lot of games, as you well know, you're probably going to go up against, like, two or three carries in most public games. So, it's great for that. The armor reduction is also in an aura, which is very, very nice. But, um... Is it really going to benefit all as much? Like, that's something you really got to think about. Am I against a team that's, like, really stacking a lot of armor? Not really. Am I against, like, say, uh, some of the high base armor, like, say, Dragon Knight? I'm not. However, reducing armor is good in almost any situation. Because whenever you reduce armor, what that's going to do is... It's basically going to make your feast proc more. So, the way this works is that whenever you hit a target... It's going to calculate their total HP at that current time, and it's going to take your damage, and then it's going to add Feast on top of that. So adding an armor reduction on top of that is going to help you, but I feel like this particular game, it's not all that important of a pickup. Pudge is going to deal close to no physical damage. Tidehunter, no, he's pretty much all magical. Bloodseeker, again, I'm not really worried about, especially because his ultimate is pure damage. Morphling, yeah, sure, that's like the main person I'd be going for. And Wisp, obviously, no, not worried about... Wisp in terms of physical damage. But picking up something like a Mjolnir could be very awesome. So Mjolnir is a good item on Lifestealer because it fills in some gaps that you otherwise need some help with. The damage is negligible, plus 24 is okay, but that's not that good. The reason this item is nice is because it gives you a ton of attack speed. Really, really good attack speed. So coming in here, another team fight going down. Again, I'm trying to focus down the Morphling. In this case, he's gonna be able to uh, he's gonna be able to <clears throat> Excuse me, waveform away, no problem. Another good X mark to spot going down, gonna ensure we get a kill on the Tide Hunter, and there we go. I'll have my vengeance, yes. <laughs> More like dead hunter. Oh man, those voice lines. Fear so nothing. notice in these team fights how much we're suffering because we don't have any stuns. We have no way to keep these guys in place. What I'm having to hope for is you know for like a good X mark to spot, like the Kunkka has been getting, or for my skull basher to proc. That's about it. Like, we have some slows, yeah, but that's not going to stop the Morphling from waveforming away. It's not going to, it's not really going to help the Wisp from coming in there and using Tether to give the ally bonus movement speed. So stuff like that is really important. We're definitely lacking in the stuns. Looks like I am going to try to go ahead and finish this uh, Mjolnir here. This is also nice because it gives you the chance to become a good pusher due to its Radiant chain lightning that you can proc on hitting a target. This is also nice in team fights too. Dying Being able to hit multiple people with that chain lightning is actually pretty nice. Also, if you cast the static charge on whoever is being focused, it's probably going to proc that, and yeah, you're going to be doing lightning damage all over the place. Kind of nice. Not a lot of damage. I, I, that's not really the point of the item, but just kind of a nice perk. The main point of this is the attack speed is so huge. God, you get a lot of attack speed from this. So, that's a good item to pick up. One thing I do want to point out right away in regards to items is that Feast and your Armlet, these are not orb effects, or I should say, they're not unique attack modifiers. A good unique attack modifiers for Lifestealer might be something like a Desolator. This gives you armor reduction and it gives you damage. Both of these stats are great. Reasonable price. I'm not going to pick this up every game. This is just a brute force damage item, but this is a good unique attack modifier for Lifestealer to pick up. 
Very, very nice. Uh, some other items you can definitely get. Oh, there are a lot of things you can get for life stealer. <laughs> but those are just some examples. Always be thinking, like, what is really going to help me in this particular situation? What are items that are not that great? Items that are not that great would be something like a BKB. You have a built-in magic immunity. What's the point? I'm not saying you should never consider the possibility, but that have to be... That's really situational. <laughs> that's really, really situational. Or perhaps you find that you do need a bit more sur survivability. Maybe you want to go for something like a uh, Heart of Tarask. This is a great item on Lifestealer, even though it is defensive. And yeah, like the health restored per second is... It's, it's good for recovering after a team fight. But what's nice about this is that the 40 strength is going to give you a lot of damage. The 300 health is going to make you pretty tanky. But the reason that this item is great is because you can leave your armlet on indefinitely. You never have to turn it off if you have this item. So just some few things to think about. They do pick up a Roshan, so it's kind of looking a little scary here. I, uh, I still think I can out-carry the Morphling, but we're definitely going to have to pick up our game and start thinking a little bit more about how we're doing. Overall, throughout this game, even though, yeah, my score is pretty decent, I, I do not like how I've handled the team fights. Most of these situations, I've chased too much, i miss mistimed my abilities, or I've went in on fights where I just know I'm going to suicide and throw myself away. Always be willing to admit these faults in yourself and watch replays and really watch how you handle these situations. So Pudchuk almost hits me. I have a retardedly delayed reaction there. I, uh, I pop my Q because I'm like, oh god, I'm about to get hooked. So that wasn't that good. So Rupture going down on the Omni Knight. Mechanism is popped by us. Um, boat coming in. Looks like it's going to maybe hit a couple of heroes here. Good play. I'm trying to focus down the Blood Stealer just to get someone off the field here. So Ravage is popped. And now the Morphling is going to have to try to do his work. So that's going to go and pop the Aegis. Wisp is going to go down as well. We're definitely winning the Steam fight. Morphling's coming back. And it looks like he is going to be trying to go on the run here. He does pick off the Omni Knight. Morphing into Strength. Nice play. I like how he's doing this. I do proc a Bash. So he's stunned for 1.4 seconds. And now he's on the run. Waveforms into the forest. And oh my. Oh my god. <laughs> He jukes us out so hard here. I love this play. He went to the trees and he doubled back toward our base. He didn't choose to, you know, say like run over toward that way. I teleport bottom to try to cut off his escape. But he's going to get away from this just fine. So, uh, well played by the Morphling. I definitely like what he did there and I hate how I handled that. So, but you got to give credit where it's due, right? Let's take a minute, let's take a look like at the uh, goal and XP graphs and see where we stand. So, if we look right now at the gold per minute, mine is finally uh, quite good. This is fairly reasonable. Uh, so the Morphling is okay. Uh, everyone else, eh, not too bad. So, I definitely want to be like around this gold per minute range. I want to be better than this. By the way, this is not all that great, especially considering I had Hand of Midas. By the way, my decision to sell Hand of Midas earlier, I think, was definitely a mistake. I feel like, um, I actually forgot at what point I did that exactly, but I had the choice to sell a Hand of Midas or a Quelling Blade, and I decided to sell my, um, Hand of Midas instead. That was retarded. That was really, really silly. Quelling Blade's not going to give me any benefit, like, hardly anything anymore this late in the game, so that was definitely a mistake. Take a look at the XP graphs here. This is, man, this is all over the place. So, hey. notice how these team fights are going up and down, up and down. At one point, we were we were dead even just a couple of minutes ago. So, that's definitely going all over the place. Gold graph is massively in our favor. A big part of this is due to me having the Hand of Midas. And we're probably farming a little bit better than these guys are as well. Let's take a look here, just like at the average uh, last hits. So, mine's going to be inflated due to being in the jungle. Uh, <clears throat> the Morphling for this late in the game, last hits, or, uh, that's okay, not that great. Um, all around the board, uh, definitely n not very good last hits all around the board here, unfortunately. But again, I, I want to emphasize this is just a very simple, very humble public game. We're terrible. I'm making these videos so you don't have to be terrible. Next item I'm picking up, it looks like I am going to pick up a Daedalus, and I'm going for, or a Crystalus, and I'm going for a Daedalus. So, I feel like, okay... I'm pretty survivable. I'm not that worried about dying in fights, so I need more damage. 
The nice thing about this is that whenever you proc a critical, that does take into account the percentage you're getting from your feast. So that's going to make Life Stealer's criticals huge, really, really big. I'm chasing after this Tide Hunter. Yet again, another good X mark to spot going down. This is going to ensure that we, are, we get a kill on this guy. And you saw I proc two criticals there for about 570 damage each. That is huge. With the armlet on, I have quite a lot of HP. Turn that back off. Okay, Wisp is going to die as well. So, this is going to turn the game around. And it looks like, unfortunately, the uh, Morphling did disconnect, which... <clears throat> excuse me, which does kind of suck, but... Hey, if that happens and the game is this close, pause. You can see uh, the Chain Lightning going off here. Definitely helping in the push. Clear the Creep Wave out very, very quickly. Taking down this tower almost immediately. Lift does go down. It's not going to be enough, though. And without a Tide Hunter, looks like Pudge died as well somewhere, but uh, Morphling does reconnect. Uh, I do pop his Lincoln Sphere with my slow. He's taking a lot of damage here. He's going to have to waveform out. He's, he's probably going to have to go back to base and heal. Another good X mark to spot going down, and oh man, that's going to be close. He's morphing into strength. Yet again, I like how he's doing this. That is the only thing keeping him alive is morphing into strength there. Waveforms away, and he's going to be able to survive that. If I would have been able to get off like a bash or two from my skull basher, that would have went a lot differently. So that's kind of I have mixed feelings about skull basher. It's like not always an item you should get. Definitely luck based. Focus down the pudge really really quickly. Kind of pointless, but that's okay. Tide hunter can be absolutely no problem. Good Omni Nine ultimate going down. That's going to ensure that the morphling really can't do anything for several seconds. Okay, finally, finally engage him in some fun life stealer stuff here. Looks like I'm in a 1v4 situation, and see, here's the problem. Look how much I'm being kited around. I can't catch up to these guys. There's nothing I can do here. And it looks like this is going to be close. I'm probably going to go down. Good heal from the Omni Knight, trying to keep me alive. I may have been able to survive that if I would have armed and toggled. If I would have armlet toggled whenever I was really low, turn it back on, instantly gain about 400 HP, that probably would have kept me alive. Misplay on my part, yet again, chasing too much and just not, it's not thinking. Just really just not thinking about what I'm doing. Okay, looks like, I don't think these guys are going to be able to push, though. Kunk is going to be back up and I'm the only one that's down. Uh, Viper is definitely dead here, though. Let's take a look at Morphling's build and see how he's doing. So he's got his Lincolns, got his Manta, pretty good stuff. At this point in the game, he should definitely have a lot more. Um, I should too. By the way, I should have more than this. I should definitely have my uh, <coughs> Daedalus finished since I decided to go this path. You can pick up something like an Abyssal Blade as like a super, super late game luxury. Let's take a look at that real quick. So this item is nice, but not all that great for the cost in my opinion. Uh, I would have to pick up a Sacred Relic, which this can give me a lot more damage. And I still keep the Bass Chance, but I can use its active for a two-second stun that goes through Magic Immunity. Kind of a cool item, but this is absolutely luxury. This is not an item I would like ever focus on getting. I feel like um, in this particular game that perhaps a Heart would be a good pickup. Heart basically makes sure you're never going to die, <laughs> and you can leave your armlet on all the time. So I really like this item. Definitely worth considering. There are other items that are good on Life Stealer that I have not talked about, by the way. But again, look at the situation, think about what's going to be good for it, and proceed accordingly. So we're definitely getting pretty late in the game here. They do have two barracks down. It's going to be very, very hard for them to come back from this. So uh, Life Stealer is very, very good against strength-based heroes in general. He's extremely good against heroes with high HP pools particularly heroes like Pudge with a high HP pool, or um, Tidehunter is another good example for that. So, do have a team fight going down. Uh, he threw a boat into the Rashawn, but unfortunately they weren't there. Omni Knight Ultimate being cast. Pudge ult completely wasted. Again, Life Stealer's Magic Immunity make sure that isn't going to affect you. Ravage does hit me though. Oh, I'm going to go off screen like that. And... Fighting the Life Stealer here, it's going to be kind of close. He's going to waveform away, but the uh, Blood Seeker is definitely in way too deep. You're going to turn around and start focusing him. I do have my Static Charge going, getting a little bit of extra Lightning damage there. Never a bad thing. Chasing after these guys, cast a slow in the Wisp. Definitely going to die. Get some spiders out of it. If I, wow, did I seriously not notice this at the time? Okay, so there there was a punch down there, and I think he got teleported back. That's what happened. Wow, I cannot believe I did not notice that at the time. 
I tell you, if you want to get better at this game, like even more so than uh, watching these videos, watch your own replays, guys. Seriously, watch your replays and just look at all the mistakes that are made as you're playing. Very, very important stuff. Okay, more fling is super, super low here. Lincoln Sphere is popped. Manta Style is also used. Pudge stands absolutely no chance here. That was awfully silly of him. Tidehunter, and if I actually get up on the Tidehunter, I want you to really notice like the bonus damage from the Feast, but looks like the Morphling is finally going to go down. So the Morphling played a pretty decent game. He really knew how to use his uh, Morph effectively, how to get away out of bad situations, so that was nice. So again, Life Stealer is really, really good against uh, strength-based heroes. Your Feast, the more HP you have, the more damage he's going to do with Feast. That means that building items that boost your HP pool is basically just going to make Life Stealer hit you harder. Definitely keep that stuff in mind. And that's going to be it, guys. So, Life Stealer, awesome hero. I know I say this about every character that I play, but this guy is absolutely one of my favorites. He is so much fun. So, so strong, too. Alright, guys, good. Hope you enjoyed watching this replay. Any questions, comments, or again, if you just want to say hello, feel free to post them in the comments section. We'll take a quick look at the gold and XP and go from there. Okay, good. So, again, guys, I want to emphasize that even though my score here, 16 and 4, I don't really like how I played a lot of these team fights. The reason that we won as well as we did here is the enemy team played worse. I don't think we played all that well. I like the Morphling's play here. Uh, but again, score is not everything, guys. Keep that in mind. All right. Thanks for watching.